welcome to this panel discussion on how to be effective when you're advocating with the Oregon State Legislature. Um, this is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Portland. At the League, we aim to make democracy work by protecting everyone's right to vote, encouraging people to learn more about the issues happening in their community, and promoting citizens to speak up and take an active role in our government. This program is being taped by East Portland Community Media for rebroadcast, and it'll be available for online viewing at the League of Women Voters website, lwvpdx.org. Uh, the program is supported by a grant from the Multnomah Bar Foundation. Tonight's speakers are gonna share their experience at being effective and working with the state legislature. They each have a different perspective and we hope that their experiences will help you if you're thinking about communicating or advocating with the legislature. So each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes about their experience and then they'll have a chance to ask each other questions and then they'll answer questions from the audience. So if you have a question, write it down on one of these cards and we'll um, ask it at the end. So our first speaker is Alice Bartelt. Alice's perspective is deeply steeped in her league experience. She's the chair of the Action Committee for the Oregon State League, as well as its parliamentarian. The Action Committee is our advocacy arm, and Alice is a registered lobbyist on behalf of the league. In addition to her league work, she has been active in many civic and advocacy organizations. Alice. Thank you. Um, as uh, Kristen said, I'm the chair of the action committee for the league at the state level. And what started out when I first started with about four or five of us working on issues, we now have about 20 people working on issues. So it's very exciting because we've been able to branch out. Our action um, committee is made up of, um, I'm the chair and then we have five coordinators for different areas, and then they have people that are portfolio chairs under them. So an example is our um, natural resources, it's Peggy Lynch, and she has someone following air quality, she has someone following um, our uh, the environmental issues, uh, and, uh, and like Ariel Spring, we had somebody working on that. At the Elliott Forest, we had somebody working on that. So we have different people working on different aspects of what we do. Uh, we base our positions on studies that we have done at the state level and we can also use the ones that are done at the national level to um, go in and advocate for, for certain things. Uh, and um, so at this point uh, we have specific things that we can work on. Sometimes we're asked to work on things that we have no position on, so we don't work on it. But um, if, if you think of a good, good uh, study that you want to do, and you can round up the people to do it, and, and it's something that we haven't done, or that something needs to be um, updated, think about that, because every two years at our convention, we can adopt more studies. So that's something good to know. Um, and the, uh, a couple things I wanted to talk about. Uh, one of them is a wonderful resource called the Oregon Legislative Information System. And in, and in your handout, this is what I brought, the legislative process, and this gets handed out to um, our folks that come to the legislative process day, but not everybody can make that. Yes, <laughs> it's up back there on the table if you need one. Uh, and our, uh, leg our uh, Oregon Legislative Information System gives you the opportunity to follow legislation without even going to the Capitol. In years gone by, if you had to go in and pick up bills and read them and then try to figure out where everything was by using their daily schedule, but now everything's online. So you can actually sign up. If you're interested in a certain subject, you can go in and put that in to the search box and it will bring up whatever bills are, are uh, pending about that. And if you have a particular bill you want to do, um, you can follow that too, and you can can sign up for to get alerts when the bill is going to be heard in committee or if it's going to be heard on the floor of one of the chambers. So there, it's it's a really wonderful um, resource for people in Oregon. 
so that you do not have to go to Salem in order to have an impact. Of course, the best thing to do is, if you can, but uh, to meet with your legislators. But you'll hear more about that from the other two folks here. Um, but I did want you to, to think about having, um, looking at that website because it is really important in terms of keeping track of what's happening at the legislature. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of bills. We get over 3,000 bills introduced every single session. And some of them never get a hearing, but many of them do. And so trying to follow all of them and figure out where they're going and to either support some of them or to try to defeat some of them, uh, we have to, to know about them and we have to follow them. So um, that is, uh, the, the, le the website is on page nine at the top of the page. So if you want to go in and do that. Um, when, uh, I did want to explain a little bit about the process. Um, a bill comes into being because somebody's thought of an idea that they want to have happen. And so a legislator has to uh, sponsor that idea, and they have to submit the idea or as much of it as they can to legislative council, who will then draft a bill. And once that bill is drafted, once the session starts, then it will go either to the Senate president or the House speaker to be read, which is basically someone stands there and reads the little bit of relating clause at the top. If they read the whole thing, it would take forever. And then the, either the president or the speaker, depending on which house it's in, um, then assigns the bill to a committee. And the work gets done in committees. That's the important thing to know, is that when a bill is assigned to a committee, they will take testimony and they will decide if the bill moves forward. And sometimes a bill will be sent to a committee to die because the president or the, the uh, House Speaker doesn't want to have it come up to be reviewed. So um, it's, that is a very powerful, those two positions are very powerful for that reason. Uh, and then the committees will hold uh, hearings. Um, part of it will be a public hearing where they will take testimony and then they have what's called a work session to decide if the bill is going to move out of that committee. And if it does, it comes out usually with a due pass recommendation. Sometimes it'll be called what's called a mi minority report if there's a, a group of the committee people that want to give the, um, ha the, the particular house an alternative to vote on. That doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. And then uh, the bill goes to the House and or goes into what, whichever chamber and will be voted upon. The bills cannot be amended on the floor, so any amendments have to happen in committee. So if a bill comes to the floor and something needs to change on it, it has to go back to the committee to be amended before it can, can come back. And then once the bill passes one chamber, it goes over to the other chamber and the same process happens. The, the, um, either the speaker or the president sends it to a committee and then the committee holds hearings. And if, if, in, if the um, second chamber changes anything, then they have to have a conference committee and then both chambers have to pass it again. So it's, it's a kind of cumbersome process, but it's meant to be because we need lots of, lots of talking about how things work. Um, as for um, the, the kinds of things too that where you can make it, where you can have an influence, one of them is submitting testimony. One of the things that happens is that all testimony goes in, all written testimony goes in by email now. I mean, you can bring testimony, written testimony if you want to, but the legislature really wants everything by email. Um, some offices don't even have paper very much anymore. They mainly want everything online. So if you would like, if you have testimony that you want to submit, you, it needs to go in by email. If you're, if you're testifying on behalf of the league, we have our own little process for uh, proving testimony. Um, the, the individual that's in charge of whatever that particular portfolio is will write the testimony and then it has to be approved by myself, by Norman Turrell, who's sitting here, who is our president uh, for the State League, and it also has to be approved by one other of the, uh, by, by the coordinator that's under that, that that person is under, and also by one other coordinator. So it gets really looked at and edited. <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe too, maybe too much, but I don't know. It, but but there's a lot of vibes that go on to it. So um, if you are following something and you want to speak on behalf of the league, you have to come through us in order to do that. You can always go as an individual. Don't mention the league and testify on things. But for for uh, bills that the league has a position on, we need to have we need to know about it and have you go through. The steps and it's it's not too hard. We do everything online. We're we're pretty efficient about that. Um, one of the other things that we do as a um, as a committee is we do a, during legislative session, the long one, we do a legislative report every single week, which brings you up to speed on the things that we are following. And I would advise if, if during that session, if I would. At least have you look at it to see if there's anything there that really you're, you might be interested in and want to follow and want to help with because we're always looking for help. There's so many bills, so many issues that we would like to work on and there's only so many of us to do it. And um, especially in the area of our, our social policy, it's huge. It's a huge, huge portfolio. Or, and so we could use more help in that direction. And Barbara, Barbara Ross has been helping us in, in a little bit uh, in her area, but we could. There's a lot of places that we could use more people. So, um, and then uh, lastly, there are some tips in this this handout on page pages 11 and 12 about how what to do when you meet with your legislator and um, how you can write to your legislator and, um, and w even with a sample letter. So um, if, you're, if you're interested, we'd be happy to talk to you. We'd be happy to have you involved. During the session, we meet every week at the Capitol, the, the Action Committee does, and we're always happy to have people come, or we, you can even call in. We have a, a conference line if, we, if people want to call in. So we're really happy to have a lot more participation because it's, it's a huge job during the session. It's, it's really huge. And even, after, even in the interim, we have three times that the legislature meets in between the sessions each year, and we monitor those as well, and we do a, a legislative report, which you'll be getting in the next couple of days, about what happened during those interim hearings. And those interim hearings are important because they are oftentimes setting up bills that will be heard during the session. So it's kind of like preliminary testimony or preliminary ideas about what someone wants to bring forward during the next session. Now in Oregon, we have a long session that happens during odd numbered years, and that um, goes usually from February 1st till about uh, the first week of July. That's the longest it can go. And then, um, then in the short session, it's only 45 days long, which starts the middle of, it starts on the first of July, uh, of February and goes until the middle of March. And it moves fast. I mean, things are just going like that because that's not much time. The short session was originally intended to take care of, um, to help rebalance the budget, because we'll get more information about how much money has come into the state. And then it's also meant to clean up anything that we, they discover was uh, in laws that were passed before that may not be working right, and they may need to do some tweaking to those laws. But we also get some substantive um, items, usually not too many, because the, the uh, Senators and the representatives are limited to the amount number of bills that they can submit in, during this short session. It's two or three bills apiece, and so they're very careful about what they spend their that those um, opportunities on. So, um, but uh, during the during the interim is also a good time to to get to know your um, senator and your representative, and that's that's probably the most important thing is that after the election we always ask that you go meet with your new senator or go meet with your senator or your representative who's been elected or reelected just to just so they know who you are know that we're concerned know that we have um, concerns about certain things if you're um, and you can even talk as a constituent if you happen to be uh, and but the that personal relationship is really important and you're going to hear that from the two of from from our other two speakers but it it is really it it's a it's an exhausting experience to work at the legislature but it's also very gratifying because we oftentimes come out with very good results and 
I'll be happy to answer questions later. So. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Diane Garrett. Diane has experience at a, as a citizen advocate. She was a volunteer lobbyist championing legislation that would ensure nursing mothers could have time and place in their workplace to express breast milk. For two years, she made weekly trips to Salem with her young daughter, who is in the audience tonight, um, um, to talk to legislators and build momentum for the legislation, which eventually did pass, and um, we think is the strongest legislation of its kind in the United States. I think, I think it is, unless I'm not mistaken, yeah. I'm really honored to be here and get a chance to share my story with all of you because it's hard to believe it's been 10 years since, um, since my bill passed. And um, so it's good to think back on that accomplishment and be so happy that the community has the access to taking care of their kids um, in the way that feels right to them. Uh, maybe I can just back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about the organization that I was part of while I did this advocacy work. Um, some of you may have heard of Nursing Mothers Council of Oregon. It's a very small grassroots organization that just over the years has punched way above its weight in terms of how it has helped so many moms and babies in a variety of situations, you know, just try and get the best start um, in life. We have a lot of lactation consultants that are part of the organization. Um, and then we have a lot of people just like me who are new moms that want to help other new moms. It's primarily a peer-to-peer -peer breastfeeding counseling organization. It's not a lobbying group. Um, so we get some initial training, and then we sign up for time on a phone line, and the calls get forwarded to you at your home 24 hours a day for whatever you signed up for, and you take that 2 a.m. call <laughs> that we've all, we've either been that person or we've had a loved one we've been supporting with a brand new baby who just feels scared or has a question or a problem, and you kind of, help provide some support and some advice and help direct them to resources. So when I joined Nursing Mothers Council, I was trained as a peer breastfeeding counselor and I started taking calls. And one of the calls that I got many times over was from mothers needing to go back to work or they had already gone back to work and they were in tears because their employer would not facilitate break time for them to go express breast milk so that they could keep nursing their baby. And so many um, infant nutrition choices were being driven by the flexibility of an individual employer. and. After I had my heart broken on several of those calls, I started to get upset <laughs> about this. And I went to one of um, the leaders in our group and I said, you know, what must be done about this? And she smiled and said, we must pass a law. And I said, sign me up where, what? <laughs> I don't have any experience with any of this. I'm still a fairly new breastfeeding peer counselor. I thought I was just going to be helping moms on the phone. And all of a sudden, in the fall of 2004, like November, I mean, the session is like coming very fast. We formed a legislative committee um, to continue pushing forward, um, making a time and a place simply a expected, like you get a 10 or 15 minute break or a lunch break that you have this opportunity. So um, like I said, we're a very small grassroots organization. We'd never done an advocacy um, push quite like this before, although this issue 
had been moved legislatively since about 1999. What the issue um, lacked was a consistent person that would commit to being the face for the issue. Um, and that is one of the things, I have three things that I just, what, that I learned that I wanted to share with you from my experience. And one of those things is you need consistent, passionate lobbying, like what Alice was sharing. And you need um, powerful champions. And then you need access to media. Those were kind of the three, and you need a little bit of luck. <laughs> um, but those were kind of the three things that we, some of it we kind of saw immediately and other things we kind of learned more about along the way. Um, at the time, at the federal level, the CDC and DHHS were exploring ways um, to really inject life into grassroots community efforts um, around health issues, specifically like breastfeeding. And so Nursing Mothers Council was given, um, they became a community demonstration project. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. What it is is a little bit of money and a whole lot of work and a whole lot of chance to learn and connect with people. And one of the big outcomes from that was we learned all about how to connect with media and how to really leverage that opportunity. Um, none of us had government relations experience. We learned how to write press releases. We learned how to contact the media. You know, all of these kind of nuts and bolts things that help you learn how to use that to your advantage for visibility. Um, now, 10 and 12 years ago, the media landscape was really quite different. So I don't know that I can speak to all of how people are leveraging it now. And, you know, during my time, print media was, you know, we still had a daily Oregonian that was happening. And it just seems like ancient history, but um, it really wasn't very long ago. So just as an example of how we were able to use media or how that kind of gained momentum, um, in the beginning, um, Jeff Mapes did um, a personal interest story. It was kind of a little sidebar in the community living section, you know, and he did kind of a personal interest story. Um, and then eventually we got on the business section page um, which was kind of another step forward and maybe a different audience to be able to speak to about our issue. And um, then eventually we made it to a face-to-face -face meeting with the editorial board at the Oregonian. Um, and then we knew we were really playing with real money because um, when the editorial board speaks favorably, um, gives a favorable opinion of your issue, then it generates a lot of conversation in the community. And then in the end, when the bill was passed and signed, we were front page top fold um, on a Saturday. So you can just kind of, if you think of that arc, um, where in the beginning we started out as something kind of interesting, this underdog meets big business kind of thing, all the way to a very accomplished you know, two-page significant summary um, out of all the things that happened that session, you know, that we were able to get that shows that we learned something very important about media and we knew how to handle that. Um, regarding um, the consistent lobbying, as I said, 2005 wasn't the first time people had taken a run at this issue. Um, Nursing Mothers Council just decided we were gonna see if someone would go down and do it, and I said I would go down and do it because I was able to, uh, little did I know. <laughs> um, and we had um, a mentor, I don't know if some of you know Ann Kelly Feeney, you might know Ann. Um, she was a member of Nursing Mothers Council at the time and she was an experienced lobbyist. And so she said, well, I'll take you down there. You know, I don't remember, I don't think I'd ever been down to the legislature before. So this was, I was walking into a pretty important gig into the building for the first time. <laughs> And you know, she took me all through the 
you know, the guts of the building, you know, where people eat and where the committee rooms are and who the important people were and all of these lobbyists and introducing me around and basically then said, okay, good luck. <laughs> and um, so I just started trying to learn the ropes. And in that first session, of course, we were very late to the game, but the Senate was, has always been friendly to this cause. And um, our objective was a mandate and it was for a uh, time and a private place for a mom to be able to express her milk while she's on the job. We weren't asking for paid time, it would be unpaid time. Um, uh, but the real tough part was we were asking for it to be enforceable with a penalty. And um, that right away drew a lot of red flags with the business community, of course. And we didn't have the savvy, nor was the political climate such in 2005 that we could prevail with a mandate. But we did um, get our bill all the way across the finish line as an encouragement. And we gutted our own bill before someone else could gut it so we could have some dignity. Um, but the business lobby was very um, powerful, you know, as it always is, and is a force to be reckoned with, and it should be. Um, but that year, in 2005, they labeled our little bill as the single biggest threat to Oregon's economic recovery. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> uh, and it was, it was interesting to, to see uh, that kind of very strong uh, op opposing response. I hadn't really expected that. I didn't really quite know how to you know, where to go with that. I, I remember walking into friendly meetings with this, what I thought were friendly meetings with Associated Oregon Industries and having them, you know, sit down with me and tell me they were going to bury me. And then, you know, bring in the grocers and have him stand over me in this very intimidating way. So there is, it is true, there is a lot of that posturing and pressure and power that's brought to bear even on moms and babies, which really, um, is a very sad thing to see people on the wrong side of that issue. But um, we resolved to come back and add to that language. We lost um, allies at that moment when we didn't get our mandate passed. People were pretty upset. Um, but the thing I had learned that maybe other people didn't quite understand was once you got something in statute, you had something that you could modify. It was a huge step forward that we got this encouragement. You know, changing may to shall was the next step for us. And um, so the media followed this story. We got it across the finish line. We made a whole lot of friends and strategic partners, and we educated a lot of people that hadn't received education before. And we got the attention of one person in particular, and that was the House Minority Leader of the time, Jeff Merkley. And um, he, at the time, was my representative. So it was not difficult for me to get a meeting with him. And he became an immediate, ardent supporter. He clicked with this issue and was very interested in it. So then I had my third ingredient. We'd always had champions, but now I had this new possibility of a new champion, and we really couldn't have predicted how the cards fell, but in 2007, as you probably remember, the House flipped to a Democratic majority, and then he became Speaker. <laughs> and suddenly, I had that little bit of luck that I had someone who was a champion and he was in a position of power and influence to put our bill, our new bill that had been modified and redrafted to incorporate all we had learned, to put it on the priority list. And there really is a priority list, and it's a lot smaller than 3,000 bills, I can tell you that. And um, so we had all the same challenges as before, we still had the same opposition, the same complexities, the same timelines, um, but we had a little bit of wind in our back, and we had committees, you know, you have to get to the administrator of the committees, they're not an elected person, but if you have their ear, they set agendas. 
So all of those people, be, you know, all those career people became my friends. You know, I got to know the staff attorney that was drafting the bill and learned a lot from him. And um, we even had something like Dash 14 amendments. We had so many people proposing amendments and messing with that bill all along the way. And it could have been watered down, but we had champions that would not allow that. And we found unexpected allies. Um, there were women who were strongly opposed to it when you would think this would be a natural issue for them. And there were men that strongly supported it in ways that you wouldn't have thought. I mean, I still remember Andy Olson from Albany. He supported the bill, and he's you know a police officer. And he pulls a story out about how he was able to support one of his employees through all of this. And I thought, you just never know where you're going to find someone on this particular issue that has a personal story that has impacted them and transforms them into a supporter for your cause. Um, in the end, we did pass an enforceable mandate. It's um, the bill just for those of you that probably don't know the details of the bill, um, it covers businesses with 25 and more employees, which is about 15%. Oregon has a lot of small businesses, right? But it covers 70% of our workforce. And so we kind of found this sweet spot where employers, it was like a low impact on employers, but a high impact for the workforce. And that pleased everyone. Um, in a way that I was, I was pleasantly surprised by that. I really didn't know what we were going to get. We were looking at, you know, 50 and up. Well, that was kind of not so great. So we fought for 25 and we got it. Um, but the mandate is the big piece, and it's $1,000 for each violation. And each violation is per missed break. <laughs> So this got everyone to stand up and take notice. And no longer were employers going to say, we're so supportive of moms and babies and families. Um, we just want to do it our way. We don't want a regulation. We don't want to be told what to do. And we were able to say, no, we are, we are going to do it this way. And you're going to make way for the moms and babies. So um, that is kind of the big arc you know, of of our story, and I think kind of, I have a couple of postscripts, um, and I probably ran out of time, but I'll be quick. Um, when Jeff announced his candidacy for US Senate, it so happened that he was at our little organization's annual luncheon, and he made his announcement that day, and he also made his first campaign promise, and it was to us, that he would take this to the national level. And this was when I knew that I had a true champion because he was taking up the work voluntarily himself. And I never had to wonder, is he going to keep doing that? Because I knew that he had internalized the reality of it. And he was able to make good on that promise when the Affordable Care Act passed in 2009. And he rolled language very similar to Oregon's into the Affordable Care Act. And it passed. And that's pretty amazing um, that he did that and that he found his allies and opportunities in unexpected places. Um, as Alice said, this work is enormously challenging. It does require keen instinct. It does require determination. And just uh, you have to have an intrinsic passion for it because there's so much push and pull in the legislature. And it really is a power struggle. And people often seem to lose sight of what they're even talking about. Sometimes um, they can get really distracted by all of that. So um, I just kept telling people that taking care of kids is a core value. And you know, it's not about Democrat kids or Republican kids or anything else but our kids. And um, by the end, lots of people were well-versed on the issue because we'd done our job. And they'd had their own experiences. And they wanted to take action. And they were waiting for someone like me to come along and fill in the picture. 
Um, I do have a couple of pictures just to give you a visual because this really is, um, it's not, so this is, um, so this is a picture of, um, we had a bill signing and this is Governor Kulangowski signing our bill in May of 2007. And then this is the picture that I wanted to reflect on, not because it's such a great picture of me, but, <laughs> but um, because I came along and completed the picture, it's the embodiment of a democratic um, ideal. Because what he did was he signed the bill and then he stood up, and I did not ex didn't know he was going to do this, but he gave me his seat. And then I, I sat down. And I feel that was such a beautiful expression of the democratic process. And he is a very wise man to understand that the power does reside in the hands of the people. And he made way for that in that moment. Um, so it was just a very special um, full circle um, that we all went through together. And you know, maybe you're the next person to be in that picture. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Barbara Ross, another League member. She'll share her perspective of, as a legislator. She's a former state legislator, county commissioner, and school board member. And since her retirement from elected public service, she's been advocating for the homeless and for improving the criminal justice system so she can talk about it from both sides of the aisle. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And this was a really inspiring story. And it does prove that the citizens have power and they can use that power to solve you know, problems that uh, in the beginning seem really impossible. Uh, but if you seem somewhat overwhelmed by this hero and you say, well, I could never do all that and the media stuff and it's, and it's really scary, I'd like to just talk about how you as an individual, if you haven't been active at the legislature or if you've just been around the edges, I'd like to just talk to you about how you can make an impact, how you can be a part of this process in a way that is, is comfortable and meaningful for you. Uh, uh, the first thing I think you need to do is to choose an issue that's important to you. Is it housing? Is it homelessness? Is it health care? Is it climate change? Uh, is it air quality? You know, something that really speaks to you and that you feel that you would be willing to work for if you could find a niche to work for it. And then after you've decided on your piece, uh, then look for a piece of legislation that that em embodies some of your goals. It may not be exactly what you think, but uh, there are always a lot of bills on all of these issues. Now, right now, we are facing uh, we are facing the a short session, and it'll just be a one month session. So they're supposed to be really focus on on financial and budget issues, and and mainly they do. And some of those are really technical, and some of them are really boring. But most interest areas have at least one or two bills that they are really trying to promote during the short session. And an example of that uh, is one that Debbie Runciman brought to me, which is the Family and Medical Leave uh, Insurance Act. And it was in the last session, 3087, House Bill 3087. It didn't pass. There were other priorities that people worked on harder. This one didn't make it. So the advocates are really saying, OK, we want to do this during this short session, and we're ready, and we're getting our muscle together. So that's an example of a family uh, uh, bill that talks about having paid leave for people for medical emergencies uh, in their family or uh, some other time when they really need to take care of their kids or their parents or they haven't injured themselves and they need paid medical leave. Uh, so so uh, when you get a bill, when you get a piece of legislation that somebody's proposing, then you want to look at who's supporting it, what coalitions are behind it. And on this particular bill, there are two coalitions. And one is called Time for Oregon, and the other is called uh, uh, Family Forward Oregon. And the League of Women Voters has, through a process and through discussion, decided to join this, or this coalition called Time for Oregon. 
and Debbie Runciman, who's on the state board, is uh, really uh, championing this bill, and she also goes to the state uh, action committee meetings. So that's an example of a bill that didn't get through last time, but people are wanting to do this time. It's a, it's a bill that you can really understand. It has a human side to it, and it's something that you can really believe in, and the league has already taken a position that they're gonna support it. So after you've decided, whatever it is, clean air, whatever, then, uh, and you find out which organizations are working on it, you wanna do some research, and you can do this by just poking around uh, on the websites of these organizations, listen to what they're saying, kind of get your feet on the ground, and uh, then after you've really made your personal commitment to that piece of legislation, uh, you want to start tracking it early. And right now we're in the in the fall session. And okay, now the next thing it's it's going to says it says make an appointment with your own representative and senators. And there are two pieces to this piece. One piece is getting the appointment and how you do that, and the other piece is what you do after you get the appointment. So to get an appointment with your representative and your constituent, so start with your own representative and senator, and uh, you, you go to their website, you get their telephone number, you do two things. You write an email asking for an appointment, and you make a call to the staff asking for an appointment. And you can uh, ask staff, is it better to try to see them during legislative days when they're gonna be in Salem in November? Or would it be easier to get an appointment during their, uh, do they have office hours during, during, uh, in the district during their time? And staff will tell you the best way to make an appointment. But you, you need, I think the, you need to do two things. You need an uh, actual email asking for an appointment, and then you need to make the call to negotiate when would be best. And after you get an appointment, then you want to, the day before or a couple of days before, you want to confirm that appointment uh, again to say, yes, I'm coming, I'm going to be there. And, uh, and so uh, some legislators will say, I'm too busy to see you. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I'm gonna be in, in uh, Japan all the month of November and I can't see you. And so it's okay to go ahead and say, well, I'd like to talk to staff and make an appointment and get with staff. So when you get this appointment, what do you do then? Uh, first off, I think that you need to face the fact that you're gonna have 10 or 15 minutes. You can't count on an hour. So you don't wanna fool around and you wanna have clearly in your mind what two or three things you want to say. And you don't need to be really technical about the legislation. You want to tell why it's important to you. And if you have a little story about somebody that this had impacted, then that's great. Go ahead and tell your story, and but figure out how you're going to get what you have to say in less than 10 minutes because you want to give them time to respond to you. and. Uh, and also another good technique is, is to, after you get your appointment, is to go back to your coalition and ask for an expert to go with you. So that you are a constituent, they gave you the appointment because you're a constituent, but you bring an expert with you. And usually you can get somebody from the coalition to go with you, so that you have somebody who knows the nuts and bolts of the legislation, is ready to respond. So, you know, about seven minutes into the, into the um, uh, time, you want to begin to ask their opinion. What do you think about this? Do you think this, th what do you think the, uh, the chances of this passing? Who do you think will be for it? What are the, what are the opponents? Uh, you know, what are the things that are, that are against this? Uh, and uh, then you want to wrap up. You don't want to be too long. And again, being sincere, being yourself, not trying to pretend you know more than you are, not by trying to be too technical. And then also at the end, you ask their advice about how can we support you? How can we help move this forward? Uh, then as time goes on, you're gonna find out which committee this is gonna go to. You're gonna try to get an appointment with the chair of that committee, go through the same process, call, and since, since if you have a bill that's supported by the League of Women Voters, you can say, I'm with the League of Women Voters, we'd like to come in and see you, have a brief appointment. Always bring a piece of paper with you. It's either your letter that you've written or it's a fact sheet from the coalition that you have dealt with. And uh, uh, again, 
your personal sincerity, your passion, and your reasons for, for uh, supporting this are really important to that legislator. Then you can ask their advice and say, you know, what do, how can we help this? What's your advice? And also uh, develop a relationship with the staff because you may want to call back and ask staff, did I understand this right? Uh, when is it going to come for, up for a hearing? Now, when it's set for a hearing, that's the time when you want to be sure that you make contact with the committee members. And you can just go to the Capitol, walk to each of their offices, and say, I'm with the League of Women Voters, and I know this is coming up for a hearing on Thursday, and I want you to know that we strongly support it, and here's the fact sheet about it. And if you have any questions, if your representative has any questions, we'd be really happy to do research and, and respond to questions that you might have. Um, then you can submit testimony. And again, as Alice said, if you're going to testify in the name of the league, then you want to uh, draft your testimony, send it through the, the chair of that portfolio. They'll fix it up a little bit, and they'll say, well, this is not very league-like. The way you've said it is just really too obnoxious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then they'll pass it on. And and they will approve it, and then it'll be sent to the committee. So it needs a few days to get that done. Uh, but if you decide to testify in person, uh, then your testimony will have been submitted. You go in and sign up, and you can. And when they call you, you can go up, and you don't have to read your testimony. You can say, again, in a very sincere way, this is why I think this is really important. This is why. Uh, we really appreciate the support we've already gotten, and this is why we think it's really uh, an essential for the state to get this passed. So after the hearing, uh, you want to send a little thank you note to everybody that has voted yes on your bill, and again, reiterate uh, how important this is and how much we appreciate their support. Uh, and then there will be a work session, and uh, then... Uh, uh, that at the work session, that's when the actual vote will be made about whether, and then it'll, with a due pass recommendation, it'll go to the House floor, and you want to watch on your home computer at home, you don't necessarily need to drive down there again, but you want to watch the debate, hear what people say, hear what, what's brought up against it, and, uh, and there will be, there may be opposition, and it's really kind of important for you to hear that, because next it goes to the Senate, or if it was in the Senate first, it goes to the House, and it will go through the same committee process. And you can go to your senator and say, how's this going to go? And they will tell you it either, it either is going to be really uh, easy to get through or it's, um, uh, it's going to have a lot of lumps and bumps on it. So uh, uh, let's see. All right. So it can go after the committee. It can go either if it's been a delayed, it'll go to rules where you have to go through the committee process again. Or if it's money, it goes down to ways and means in the subcommittee. They'll have a bunch of hearings down there while they try to figure out if they have enough money to fund it. Uh, and then after that, those processes, then it goes to the other house. So you need to watch where it's going. Also, the, uh, the amendments are important because sometimes the amendments gut the bill. <laughs> sometimes the amendments uh, are something that you want to speak out against. And sometimes the amendments are, you know, good, good things that have been brought and make it, make it stronger. Um, so uh, attending coalition meetings, uh, and talking to other coalition members uh, and uh, talking to other people, listening to what other people say, really kind of pulling together what the opposition is saying, what, what, what's the other side saying, and that's particularly important to gather that when you have testimony in the second house so that you are addressing the, uh, the opposition, the arguments that have been brought up against it when, when you're uh, you can submit the same testimony, but you can also go back and add and respond to arguments that have been that have been brought up. Um, and always be really polite and respectful to staff and to the legislators. You may disagree really strongly with what they have to say. Uh, you may really be internally just angry that they're taking this viewpoint or that they've decided uh, to vote against your wonderful bill. Uh, but these are very hardworking people. And if you show disrespect or anger toward them, then you're making an enemy unnecessarily. And 
uh, I think we're fortunate in, uh, in Oregon. We don't have a lot of corruption in our legislative process. We have a lot of difference of opinion, but we don't have a lot of real criminals or uh, a lot of bribery or bad stuff, really slimy stuff going on in our legislature. Some of it you might not like too well, but it's, but in general, these are really hardworking, sincere people. And so it's really important to show respect for them uh, as they're uh, going along. Um, in this last legislative session, uh, I worked on uh, a bill called, uh, it was, um, I worked with this coalition called the Partnership for Safety and Savings, and it was aimed at reducing the number of people that are going to prison. And we started out with House Bill 3078, and everybody in the beginning said, it's not gonna happen, you're not gonna pass this, it's gonna be you know, mutilated in the process and it's never gonna happen, but it did. And it did because we had two very fine uh, uh, lobbyists who, were, who knew what they were doing, and we had a big coalition, a broad coalition, and we had a lot of people, individuals, volunteers like me, who were willing to go up and talk to legislators and support our, our lobbyists. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, there, was, there was some compromising, but there was excellent, uh, discussion and dialogue, and we gave plenty of a chance for the opposition to voice their opinions and their viewpoint, uh, but we stuck to our guns that these, the, the five components of that bill needed to be done if we were gonna reduce the number of people going to prison and if we were gonna avoid building a new, uh, large, expensive facility, or, and we were gonna avoid opening a new women's prison, and so we were successful but it was because a combination of a lot of citizens working on their own legislators, keeping talking, being respectful, bringing data, showing that we had the numbers that showed that these, and we had the research to show that these research-based practices would reduce the number of people going to prison, would save us money, and, and so we did have uh, bipartisan support in the end uh, it was thin, but we had it, and uh, so uh, I, I felt very good to be a, for the League of Women Voters to be a member of this coalition uh, that uh, that was able to get this really important legislation passed. So um, it was very rewarding for me, and I think that if you put your shoulder to the wheel and you join other people who believe in the things you do do, and that you. Uh, uh, join with them that you can really enjoy the process and learn a lot at the same time. Thank you. Um, now I'll give you a chance to ask questions of each other, oh. if you have any for each other. Uh, Alice, uh, talk a little bit more about the, the chairs of the portfolios and the process that they go through to, uh, to approve testimony if somebody wants to give, submit testimony, exactly how they do that. Right. Um, we have, um, the, the chairs of the portfolios are usually, like Barbara, where they've got a certain section that they work on. And then we have coordinators. We have a coordinator for, for natural resources. We have a coordinator for governance. We have a coordinator for education. We have a coordinator for um, social uh, policy, and then we also have a coordinator for access. And so if, if somebody like Barbara writes testimony, it will go first of all to the coordinator for social policy. Who's Karen Nibbler. Who is Karen Nibbler, yep. And, uh, and then she will then send it on to all of the rest of the coordinators and myself and the state president, Norman. And then we will edit. We do a lot of editing <laughs> during the session. That's what I feel like my main job is, it seems like. It's editing stuff. But we just make sure that um, it sounds league-like. And, and it may, that may sound a little hokey, but we do have a way of saying things. And we, uh, we kind of try to stick to that. We have a style guide and we just try to make sure that it comes out sounding consistent and that, that's the big thing. And it's, it's very seldom that we change very much. I mean, we don't, we don't do a whole lot of changing, but if something is incorrect or if something gets a little 
too casual or something like that, then we'll, we'll ask to change it. And, and then there's, there's this simple thing of typos because it's hard to, to proofread your own stuff. <laughs> so, um, but that, gets, that can get done pretty fast. I mean, we usually turn it around within 24 hours and sometimes less than that. Depend, and and if, we're, if we know something's coming ahead of time, we'll be looking for it and try to get it done really fast. And I would like to say one thing you were talking about is you can watch all of these hearings and you can watch the floor sessions on the website that the, that the state has. So if you, you're really interested in a bill and you wanna hear what the legislature has to say about it, or what the committee is saying and that kind of thing, you can watch it without having to actually be in the room. So um, that's, that's another resource. I, like I said, this is a fantastic website. We have one of the best ones, I think, in the whole country. Because, and that's one thing that our access person has really worked on. And um, a, number of the, uh, no, a number of our other members but, um, of, the, of the action team, but we have really tried to make sure that governance happens in the legislature in a very open manner. And that's, and like Barbara said, it was not, uh, we know we don't have the kind of corruption a lot of state uh, legislatures have. So, okay, did I answer your question? Sure. <laughs> Barbara, I'm curious what inspired you to serve in the legislature? Oh. Uh. What I'm wondering, um, what inspired Barbara to serve in the legislature? Yeah. Well, uh, I was working in state government, and uh, the legislator who represented our district was a very fine person, and, uh, and, but I, I was moved to want to make a bigger impact that I was in, in the middle of the bureaucracy and a lot of times you couldn't do things that you wanted to do or you felt that your section wasn't getting the attention it should or, or that the legislature didn't really understand how wonderful we were. <laughs> and I was working for the Department of Human Services. And so, so uh, uh, when our legislator from my district decided to resign, uh, I said, okay, well, this is time for me to go. And so, so, and I had been a county commissioner and I had uh, uh, been on the school board, so I had elected uh, experience and I had done a lot of lobbying as a county commissioner, so I had, you know, kind of experience and understanding uh, how important the, the legislative decisions were. And usually people run for office because they're mad, you know, you're mad about something and uh, I think I was really mad that we weren't getting, uh, we weren't taxing uh, beer and alcohol for drug and alcohol treatment. And it just seemed ridiculous to me that, that we were not tapping that, that tax and that our, our treatment for addiction was so weak. And it just seemed like a missed opportunity for me. That was one of the things I was mad about. And another thing that happens too is that, especially women candidates, they often have to be asked several times mm -hmm. <laughs> before they'll run. But it sounds like you were <laughs> much, much more up Right, right. That. I, I was ready for it, but but it is harder for women to raise money, mm -hmm. and so it's really important for women to to really face the fact that you're going to have to raise a lot of money if you're going to run, and it's also important for all of us to give money to women candidates when when we have a woman candidate that's running that we believe in, then it's really important for us to step up because that is a barrier for for women candidates. Yeah. So a question from the audience, uh, does a bill have to go before the Ways and Means Committee to see if it has a budget impact? Okay, does it matter? Only if, only if it has a financial impact. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain barrier and that barrier is kind of flexible. But, uh, uh, but if, if it has a financial impact, then it goes to the subcommittee that deals with that like our bill went to the subcommittee on public safety and the subcommittee on public safety only has a certain amount of money to the the, the co-chairs of ways and means gives each subcommittee a certain amount of money and they have to decide where they're going to spend it and so we were really lucky that we got nine million dollars more in our bill than than it originally it had because um because our testimony was so powerful <laughs> in our case um that year the fiscal impact threshold was 
ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So that's a pretty low threshold to have to go to ways and means, and then you do have kind of another pitched battle <laughs> there um, to, you know, to get some space in the budget, and um, we worked with the labor commissioner at the time, trying to understand, you know, what fiscal imp- and he didn't feel that there would be, and so. That was really helpful to us that we we were able to stay below that that threshold and and go by that big committee that extra committee process but you kind of have to know that going in you have to know whether you have to anticipate that if what you're proposing is going to have a financial impact and then you have to have even farther lead time in your planning right to get get a word in on the budget as it's being crafted and proposed right um, how do party caucuses affect which bills are assigned to committee or passed out of committee? Hmm. I'll let you answer that. <laughs> well, it's a mysterious process. The, uh, <laughs> the, um, the leadership in each house really determines which bills get to committee or don't. Uh, but the discussion in caucus is also very important and the leadership is there and if a lot of people in caucus say this is really an important bill and so sometimes uh, the leadership will let it go to committee uh, expecting it to die and the people in the committee will say this is really important and they'll vote it out on the floor so as as alice said the uh, the committee process is really important and it is a flexible one now you have to pay attention because when i was the legislature i had one bill that we passed it out of the House, and I thought well, I was done, and it went to the Senate, and and uh, the, it never even got assigned to a committee. The, you know, the leadership didn't like it, and so that was, you know, so so you just you can't just assume it's going to be okay because it's uh, because it passed one House. I think that is very true. In my experience, as soon as my bill passed one chamber, I think as soon as that vote was done. I was running, and you're always running because everything's so busy. I was running across to the other chamber to get an appointment with, you know, mm-hmm. the Senate President's chief of staff yeah. mm-hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. This bill is coming. This is very important. It's on the priority list of thus and so people. And you just have to always be bringing it to their attention because everyone's clamoring, you know, for right. for that, that face-to-face. Um, urging to be prioritized. And I, I, I think it is kind of a mysterious uh, process that you're describing. Um, I don't think it's nefarious, I, maybe more organic. Um, and because things are kind of coordinated, you know, there's trading going back and forth. You know, if we move this one forward, we can move this one forward. And, you know, and in a really weird plot twist, you know, my bill got caught up because a couple of senators got in an argument about something unrelated, and as an act of spite, he held up this bill because it was he knew it was important to her. And boy, they really got into it. I, I heard after the fact that. So just some interesting things that back and forth. And one thing you can do about this is as always when you're talking to your legislator, you want to ask them to do something. And so one of the things, if you have a legislator who's not on, the, on that committee, and you can say, are you willing to speak out in favor of this in caucus? Because if you ask them to speak in favor in caucus, then they probably will. And that's, that's a way of moving this out of the shadows into uh, more um, an open place question for Alice. Of the many bills that the State League is advocating for right now, which is the highest priority and why? Um, Our big priority this last session was the budget uh, because um, there isn't enough money and um, a lot of that has happened because of ballot measure 5 and ballot measure 50 because the, the funding of schools flipped from the, the local school districts to the state. So all of a sudden we have a big chunk of money going into education that we didn't have before that measure passed. And uh, so it seems like we're chronically um, don't have enough money. 
and uh, there's a there's a lot of reasons for it, but but that was a big big one because the um, before ballot measure five, two thirds of the money came from local government, came from the local school districts, and a third came from the state. And so when that changed, it it totally flipped the ratio. And so it's been really difficult since then to try to raise to have enough money. Uh, and then um, we had like we were constantly watching both the revenue committee, the revenue committees, and ways and means to be ready to testify about this this bill or that bill, depending upon which budget we we wanted to try to increase or we rarely we rarely. Um, testified against some spending, but usually we were asking to spend money on specific things, but also to look at things like tax expenditures, which are our deductions and our tax credits. And we've been talking about that for a long time um, because we actually have a higher level of tax expenditures than we have of taxes. So we, we allow an awful lot of, it, an awful lot of um, uh, items that could be taxed that we don't, and uh, and we need to keep looking at those because, at, at, and then there's also the issue that in order to raise taxes in this state, and that's another vestige of our ballot measures, is we have to have a three-fifths vote in both houses, and that's really tough to get, um, and so it we've been you know, trying to figure out ways that we can testify and say, yes, this would be good to do this, or yes, it would be good to do that. I mean, we've supported things like raising money, like raising the taxes on alcohol. And you talk about a lobby that's powerful. I mean, we, we've been trying that for years, and it's, it's, it's still back when, I think the last time it was raised was like in the 70s. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's things like that that we have a position on. We want to, and we've supported Income taxes, I'm not income taxes, excuse me, sales taxes. Uh, and, um, and we will probably be um, taking a position to um, ask people to vote yes on the taxes being referred to, our, that probably will make it on the ballot, that's being referred to the, to the um, electorate in January because um, we, uh, we're trying to keep our Medicaid population the same, or, you know, have the money to pay for people to have health insurance, and taking that much money out of the system will be very difficult. It was interesting. I think it was in one of the, the Oregonian in the last couple of days, somebody wrote an, an op-ed asking the, um, the people that oppose this tax where we're going to find the money to replace it. And I, I'll be interested to see if we get an answer to that. But at any rate, so so we are. That's that's been our big focus. Has been trying to have enough money to fund government so that we can provide the the level of services that we need to. We all know that that uh, the Department of Human Services is is really their case managers are just having too big a caseload to to do a good job, and uh, so. You know, our, our foster care system and all those kinds of things are not getting the kind of funding that they really need to have. And it, it's difficult. I think our most of our public servants, especially in the state government, are working very hard and trying very hard to save money where they can and um, to do the best they can with what they have. Question for Diane. Did Nursing Mothers Council provide any uh, suggested bill language when initially bringing the issue to the legislature? Um, yes, we drafted the bill, um, but we did it um, based on some earlier iterations. So yes, uh, we did um, draft the bill, and that was kind of an interesting experience because I'd never done that before. So when I had a bill sponsor, then she, you know, gave me permission. She gave me a note, note from mom, is yeah. what they call it, so that I could go down and work directly with one of the staff attorneys. And in the original draft, we got to the point of enforcement mechanisms. And being the ignorant person that I was, 
when he asked me, what enforcement mechanisms do you want? I was, I didn't know. And so I said, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and to his credit, it's not his, it's not his role to say one thing or another. It's his role to craft it correctly. And so he did. And then I was trying to get some feedback from the business community about this. And um, Anne Feeney had gotten me a referral uh, to Precision Cast Parts. And I got, I do not to this day know how this happened, but I got a meeting with like all 10 of their high level managers. And I walked in with this bill with, mm -hmm. it was like, I was holding a bomb in my hand or something. They, I have never been taken out quite that way. And I realized that I had a lot to learn <laughs> about drafting legislation. <laughs> So um, fortunately, we weren't deterred by those challenges. But um, there are really wonderful career service people um, you know, that do the budgetary evaluations and that do the legal work day in and day out. And I can't imagine what it's like for them when they have a personal <laughs> opinion of, and they can't say anything you know they they take all comers from both sides and then they can't tell you who's doing what amendments so it's a very interesting um, process the drafting part of it how can the league be nonpartisan if they are lobbyists oh <laughs> lobbyists you want me to answer that um, partisanship has to do with parties and um, we are not, I mean, we do not support candidates. We do not support political parties. And lobby, being a lobbyist merely means that we are there representing an organization. And I'm a registered lobbyist, um, and I think most of our coordinators are. I don't think anybody else is. And um, the main thing is that that gives us a certain amount of credibility. And, um, but I'm there to talk about the positions that the league has. I don't take a position on candidates when I'm in front of these folks. I don't take a position on parties when I'm in front of these folks. I just, um, my job is to represent the league and our positions that we have studied and taken over the years. So um, lobbying and partisanship are two different things. And most of the lobbyists that are there, I don't know which parties. I mean, it's, in some cases, I can kind of guess which party they belong to. But that isn't necessarily, that doesn't really mean very much. So um, the, the, I, I guess that people have a hard time understanding what partisanship is. And really, partisanship has to do with a party affiliation mm -hmm. and, and the candidates that may be running from each of those parties. Right, and I think that the league uh, is credible because they they deal in facts, yes. they study things, and they only they only lobby for things that they have studied that they understand the data for and the backing for, and they they don't take up frivolous or um, odd positions that don't have a don't have a basis. And then then our lobbyists and our committee work with both sides, and we are are, uh, again, being respectful of anyone listening to their opinion and giving our reasons. And I think that's one of the reasons that the League is seen as a credible organization and is and, and, and nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. um, explain the consequences of Secretary of State letting signature gathering before language faces a legal challenge. Do you? Oh, you're that. talking about the, the ballot measure so. titles? Yes. yes. Um, we're not really in favor of that, <laughs> and par partly because um, the ballot titles that, uh, that a person that's submitting a petition might make up may or may not really be truly reflective of what's in that ballot measure. And so we're concerned that people will be signing ballot measures or signing petitions that may or may not 
have the correct information when they're signing it, and that's really what our concern is. It has to do with um, people being aware of what it is they're signing. I, the, the thing is that ballot measures are probably the worst way of legislating in the whole world because they don't get looked at for um, legality beforehand, and, um, and they also have unintended consequences. That's why we have a legislative process, and ballot measures don't get to go through that very often. Well, ballot measures that are, that are petitions from the public don't. Um, Sometimes a referral will be made by the legislature because they want the citizens to vote on something that usually happens with taxes. And then, the, and, and then what we've got coming up and probably come, have coming up in January is a refer, referendum where a group of legislature, legislators who did not like the fact that this tax passed and um, with the Medicaid bill um, got petitions out and got people to sign them and probably enough to, to put it on the ballot. But the main thing with, I mean, doing ballot measures, um, doing legislation through ballot measures is just, it's, it's really tough. Of course, we got vote by mail that way, but we had had it go through the legislature a couple times and vetoed by, the, by Governor Kitzhaber because at that point, people were convinced that it would be a bad thing. But, but for the most part, we do not get involved in ballot, me in ballot measures until they've been certified, for one thing. And so having, having people out there signing petitions where we don't know for sure whether or not they even understand what it really says, that's the, that's the point. So um, we haven't taken a particular position on that, that, that rule, at least I don't think so, have we? Yeah, have we taken a position? Okay, and are we against it, I'm assuming? <laughs> yeah, partly. It's a long discussion. Yeah, so, but, but at any rate, it's, um, ballot measures are al always par problematic, I'll tell you that, and, um, and especially the ones that come from our citizens because oftentimes they just have not thought them through, and I'm, uh, ballot measure five is a perfect example. I mean, we are, we've become, we become a, a, and and the other thing is the kicker that got put into the Constitution. So we've got two really crazy things that have happened through through um, either the initiative or through a ref, ref, referral, and it's um, it's it's really made it hard for our legislators to be able to fund our government adequately. <laughs> Can you share any tips on how to educate yourself before signing a ballot initiative? Don't. Don't. <laughs> and uh, you saw that think before you ink back there. Um, you need to read it. You need to read it. And how many people take the time to stand there and read what it says on it on the on the paper? Um, most of the time, you uh, many of our folks will say or there'll be people out ask, trying to collect uh, signatures and they'll give you a synopsis that they've been told what it is. But it's, you know, for, f there's a reason why the correct ballot title needs to be on a, on a petition and have enough information so that the person knows they can read it and no, but, but I agree with you. For the most part, we don't want people signing because it means some crazy stuff might happen. Do you have any final advice for audience members who might be thinking about advocating to the legislature? Well, uh, just, just one thing, uh, this, this uh, example that I gave, the Family and Medical Leave Insurance Act, I think that there's some material on the back page, uh, back um, mm -hmm. table if you're interested in that particular thing. And I think even if this is not what you want, it's kind of good to look at it and because it gives you an example of what people who are trying to pass a specific piece of legislation are doing right now to get ready. And, uh, but some of you may be, want to do this. And, and again, Debbie Runciman, uh, who's on our state league, is championing this particular piece of, of legislation. And uh, so she'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to work on it. So I think there's material on the back page. So I think, again, picking, but I guess I'd reemphasize picking something that you feel really is important and that you're willing to, 
to join with others who, who share your feeling and you're going to kind of uh, go through what's being proposed and pick out the piece that matches your own personal commitment. I think I would echo that sentiment. Um, that's certainly what drove me forward. It, it, was some, it was an issue that was very personal to me. I could see how it would make an impact um, across the state. And it's very important to feel excited about the work that you're doing and to feel deeply about it because it, like Alice said, it's, it is, it's tiring um, to be pushing forward on something. So you've got to have that enthusiasm. Um, and working with other people is always such a privilege. You meet so many hardworking people along the way that care so deeply and subject matter experts that you learn a lot from. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage any of you, even if you don't want to become you know, somebody that's talking on behalf of the league, at least take the time and look at the legislator, legislative web, website because you may find something that you really want to know how it comes out and you may be able to get one of our action people to kind of to, to take that that up if they're um, if they have the time to do it and like Debbie Russman is doing our women's issues so she she'll have a pretty full portfolio we belong to the women's health and wellness Alliance we belong to a lot of coalitions uh, Oregon uh, Conservation Network is a big one uh, human services coalition and uh, the, the one for safety and savings. Uh, so uh, we have we join coalitions to make to become stronger in terms of working on specific bills that all of the group can um, can support. And having a broad representation really does help to get things through. But if you're interested in anything, just I, I would I would uh, urge you to just go on the web go on this the legislature's website, and if you see something that you're interested in, you can contact me. You can contact um, any of our por portfolio people, and um, ask us, or at least let us know what your what your opinion is, because we'd like to hear it. And if you're too busy with other things to do a lot of this, then just taking the opportunity to go to lobby days, either for the league or for some other coalition like housing and ACLU. And so many organizations have a lobby day and it's all scripted and you go and they tell you where to go, but you do get a, you get a, an insight into what's going on. So I, I think it's, again, if you feel like you're too busy to do, to pick up uh, an ongoing responsibility, going to the lobby day is a good, a good window into what happens. Yeah, because you will get to talk to your legislators at that. And I would just encourage everyone to keep contributing financially. Um, if you're not able to go to the legislature, make sure that someone is. Um, you know, in our case, you know, I was a volunteer, but you really have to have people that can make some sort of living, get some of their basic needs met, you know. These are not business lobbyists who, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> the business <laughs> lobbyists make money. Right? And I have to tell so, you, all of, our, all of our action committee are volunteers. Nobody gets paid. And most of us don't even turn in expenses. <sighs> But, um, but we're dedicated and that's, but I would not say that you can't. I mean, we, we have a budget, so, but it's just, you know, most of the people that are working on the action committee are passionate about what they do. And that's what makes us, makes us so effective. And the more of us that we have working on important issues, the better that we will end up faring as a state. And we haven't talked a lot about it, but Peggy Lynch, who's the, the environmental uh, natural resources person it just has a real depth of knowledge. And one of the things she's done is to stop bad bills when people were trying to get bad bills through. Yeah. Uh, that's been another really effective thing that she has done. So there are a lot of areas that you can get involved in if you care about. Them. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you to our panel for some great information this evening. Um, this concludes the recorded part of our panel for the evening. If you want to uh, see this recording or send it to your friends, take a look on our website, lwvpdx.org. 
And um, thank you to our donors, the Multnomah Bar Foundation, the Ethel Noble Memorial Bequest, and Metro East Community Media for their support of this program. And thanks to all of our audience and to our volunteers tonight. This has been a production of Metro East Community Media and a presentation of the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund. Thank you. <laughs>